Hey, this is John Trent with BountyInTheComics.com, and uh, you're listening to the first episode of The Interview. My guest today is John De La Rose, the leading Hispanic voice in science fiction. I also think you might describe yourself as the most dangerous voice in science fiction. Is that right, John? Well, there's a PJ Media article stating that I'm such, so I, I just roll with the good quotes like that. Okay, what makes you the uh, leading uh, Hispanic voice in science fiction? Well, there's not a lot of science fiction Hispanic authors out there. Um, there is some truth to the fact that there's an underrepresentation, and I don't know why. And and when people kind of come back over that moniker, they always they always link like fantasy authors or horror authors or something like that. And I say, well, well, those aren't science fiction. Those are two different genres. So I, I actually do write science fiction in the classic sense, and I I love that. I love the genre, and I I love being able to actually lead in that genre. Um, so speaking of science fiction, you're actually doing a series called The Ember War. You're adapting it to comic book form, uh, and you got an Indiegogo going on about that. Uh, can you tell me about, about that story? Sure. The Ember War is a book series by an author named Richard Fox. He's one of the biggest authors on Amazon. His books sell anywhere from 60 to 100,000 copies. Hit this series, The Ember War has sold uh, over a half a million copies. So he's, he's actually somebody out there that's really paving the way in science fiction, which is which is what I like. Uh, him and I became friends last year, and we started talking about comic books. And I said, hey, have you ever thought about adapting your books into comics? And he said, well, no, but I'd like to. And I said, cool. He says, I have no idea how to do it. And I said, well, I do. <laughs> so uh, we just had a lot in common. Uh, I really loved the series. I really loved uh, everything he's done in the writing world. And, you know, he's he's followed me to some extent, liked what I was doing, and we just became a, a very easy pair to work with, and The Ember War was born. Now, The Ember War itself is a book, it's about an alien invasion, and they basically wipe out humanity, except for a small remnant, and then humanity fights back. Um, and somebody's plan for it, there, it's a little bit of Battlestar Galactica, a little bit of like, you know, the alien sort of thing uh, with, with just the, the action. There, it's just a lot of science fiction fun. Yeah, I was going to say, I, it looks like you got some space marines and aliens. It's got a kind of like a little bit of like Warhammer 40,000 um, vibe to it. Um, but you would, you would describe it more as uh, more Battlestar Galactica than Warhammer 40,000? A little bit, yeah. I mean, uh, Warhammer influenced Richard for sure. Uh, because because uh, because of the whole space marine thing, but uh, I, I think it has a more realistic grounding in real reality than than Warhammer does. You know, it's, Warhammer's got a fantasy and space kind of vibe to it, and the, this is uh, this is more like I don't know. It, it it's more it's more uh, I'd say almost more accessible in a lot of ways. Okay, um, why did you choose to um, adapt uh, the Ember War to the comic book medium? Well, why Richard's got a, a good, good choice. Richard's got a got a huge audience, and uh, so I wanted to work with him as it was. Uh, and then on the other end, just for comics and, and just how this translates very well to a medium, this book is just like pure action. He actually formatted it intentionally like a movie. Uh, he he describes it as Michael Bay with marginally better dialogue, oh. and uh, <laughs> so that that translates very well to a visual medium just because of the way he wrote it. So it, it's it's a lot better than most books in that regard. Okay, um, you're working with uh, Jethro Morales, and you've worked with him previously. Um, how wh what does he bring to the Ember War um, that you wouldn't see from any from another artist? I love Jethro's style. Jethro's style is very, very much his own, and you can you can definitely see Jethro Morales' art. When I when I hired my colorist uh, just recently, he he asked me originally. He said he he said, "Is this Jethro Morales?" He just looked at the art. He didn't have any 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 lines on it. I said, "Yeah." He said, "Oh, cool. I love that guy. I'll actually do it for a cheaper rate for you." And I said, "Well, this is great." <laughs> so uh, yeah, Jethro's got a style that's that's just kind of classic. It's uh, it's it's almost. You know, it's almost a little cartoony in a, in a way that's like a good way. It just feels like classic comics. It feels fun. Uh, it doesn't feel dark at all. And I really love the way he does facial expressions to get. I don't know if I'm getting too too into this, but he really captures emotion like in different sort of ways. I I, was, I see a lot of artists kind of have one emotion across faces often, and Jeth Jethro really uh, takes like faces and their expressions to the next level. So I love it. So um, 
with him taking faces and expressions to the next level, I assume there's going to be quite a bit of panels where you might have some like up close looks at the Space Marines, maybe with, like when they're having a discussion or something like that about like planning their strategy on like how to fight these aliens. Yeah, there's lots of reaction shots, and of course, lots of lots of action, as I've mentioned before. Um, I, I'm I'm a big character development kind of guy, and that's uh, that's how I kind of came up as a writer. So I focus on the elements that kind of like bring the character out and differentiate them from each other a lot uh, when I'm scripting. And I, I think Jethro helps that a lot in the way he draws. Um, you mentioned Richard Fox is the original author of the series. How involved is he with the adaptation? Is he consulting with you? Yeah, so I, I present him an outline of every issue. Uh, well, first I presented him an outline of the whole arc, and I said this breaks down really well into five issues. I, I actually took his book, I dog-eared it in different spots, and, and I, had a, I had a plan before I ever started getting into it. Um, but I outline it, I tell him how I wanna break down all the scenes, he kinda, go, he kinda gives his blessing on that. Um, he doesn't have a lot to say on that front because he doesn't, you know, really know comic books, uh, you know, in terms of writing like I do. But once it gets into the script and all that, he definitely he definitely takes care to make sure that it's authentic. And, and he acts pretty much as editor on that level. OK, um, so let's kind of move on. Um, you've been at the center of some comic skate controversy recently. Uh, maybe about a month ago, I think it was really blew up um, and it was mainly about your political beliefs um, and the kind of stuff that you believed in. Even when you were like denouncing stuff, it seemed like people were still um, going after you for your association with Vox Day. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, The Ember War is gonna be published through Vox's uh, Arc Haven Comics, is that correct? Correct, Vox is a very big science fiction fan and has been very big in this science fiction community for years. So um, what can you tell me about kind of the uh, pushback you had from people who were in in the comics uh, gate community, and do you cons still consider yourself part of comics gate? It's really weird. When I s sort of got started here, and when I started talking about comics early last year, which which a lot of people are saying it was the real start of the movement because I brought it up in the Federalist and things like that. This was a movement about you know saying. Marvel and DC are blacklisting all conservative creators. They're they're making sure all content that comes out of their houses are extreme left wing. We want to push back against this. We're raising awareness to the fact that people like Chuck Dixon, people like Gary Quappets, uh, people uh, on, on that sort of level just can't even get jobs in the comic industry, even though they're some of the best in the business. It doesn't make any sense, and it's 100% about politics. And uh, when I did research into that. It turned out, you know, it was true. Every single Marvel writer, when I did my research for my first article back in, uh, it was Mar March when I started doing my research of 2017, every single Marvel writer was espousing anti-conservative stuff on their Twitter. There wasn't even one who was silent. Every single one was in lockstep. So this revolt came about against that. And we developed a community of people who were conservatives who were on the right who were, were, were fighting back against this. And we've all been fighting back against this pretty hard uh, since that article came out and, and, and longer, some of us. Um, and Vox came in early in the fight. Uh, Vox came in with Alt Hero to really set up an alternative hero to Marvel and DC. He set up that alternative universe where there's not going to be any leftist propaganda, where he's not going to have any SJWs at all. And uh, that was something refreshing, and that's why it did so well with you know the, uh, almost $250,000 in backing. And so we kind of went along. And as this year kind of progressed, the movement really grew, I think, maybe maybe just a little too fast. And it, it started accepting people in who were on the left and, and all that, because, which is fine. Um, but people you know, don't want this sort of left-wing commentary in their comics, and that's what it came down to. Well, as soon as a lot of left-wing people kind of jumped on that bandwagon, it became, hey, we want an apolitical movement, which was not the intention to start. It was a, hey, we are conservatives and we're getting a raw deal uh, and, and we need to push back and actually change the culture. It's about, it's about creating balance. Uh, and, and you're not going to create balance by having an extreme left-wing and then an apolitical backlash against that because then everything just stays left-wing. Um, um, so I don't know. I, I – to, to I guess further the answer to the question is you know I really haven't changed in my stances, um, but um, you know some some of the people kind of surrounding uh, some of the other creators now uh, are are different than there were before. Do you still consider yourself 
part of the comics gay movement? I don't know. Um, I'm not using the hashtag at the moment because I, I think there's a sort of a, you know negative brand connotation associated with it because of a lot of people who are actually on Twitter really really actually you know giving people death threats and harassing and things like that. Um, like it or not, that is associated with the brand now. Um, I'm associated with a lot of the same people, and I'm associated with the same movement of of trying to push back uh, in terms of conservative culture. So it, I don't know. It, it depends on what your definition of is is, right? Have you have you received any death threats from anyone? Yeah, um, I, I well, I, yeah, I've, I, re I received a few uh, when this was getting real hot three weeks ago, and uh, you know a lot of people wrote a couple of those off as jokes, et cetera. But I mean, it was really scary stuff uh, coming at me. The the way people were talking to me was was really nasty, and um, you know, I mean, as as a father with some kids, I got to take that stuff seriously. So you've de dealt with ne negativity before um, in the science fiction um, novel landscape. How is this different? Um, with these, that you're, is it, was there a difference? Um, I would say it's a little stronger in science fiction because the science fiction is so entrenched far left that they're really, you know, this whole middle ground doesn't even exist there. Um, so it, it's so far and they're so far over the line that it, it's, it's really scary. I mean, I had, pe I had people there doxing my children. I have the Science Fiction Writers of America, a, uh, a writer's guild, which is supposed to protect people like me and, and provide people like me medical insurance and stuff so we can you know, continue to create. They won't let me in their organization because they say I accuse one of their members of doxing my children. Well, I know fans of one of their members dox my children because I know where it came from. But uh, that's, that's very odd that they approve of that sort of thing and they push it even to that extreme. So have, having a little bit of backlash, uh, you know, from, from some left wingers who, you know, have kind of have usurped the comics gate name is, is not that bad, I guess, compared, compared to what I've gone through before, because the real deal SJWs are really nasty. So I know you mentioned um, that you wanted to create alternative comics. Would you consider the Ember War part of that? alternative comics that you're looking for? Um, is it specifically a conservative story? I think anybody will enjoy it, and that's why it's been so so successful. But if you look at it, it's got, you know, American values like freedom. It's got, a, a you know, kind of a pro-military angle to it. Defin definitely all the military people are heroic. So, so even when you're apolitical these days, I mean, you are political to some degrees because if you don't have a transgendered lesbian knitting circle as your hero, uh, you know, you're, you're, quote, being racist and sexist uh, to uh, – a portion of uh, <laughs> a portion of the industry. Yeah, I mean, we even saw that with uh, Chelsea Kane. Uh, she just came out with her new Man Eaters book, and people were criticizing her because she didn't have any um, transgender characters. Um, and she's one of like the most outspoken um, feminists, and became like kind of like a rallying cry against people who are uh, in Comics Gate back in I think it was like 20, 2016. Correct. Yeah, well, it, it's it, it goes to show that there's no pleasing these people. No matter what you do, it's wrong, and it's and it's over your identity. It's not over anything you do or anything you say. Uh, if if you're too white, if you're too male, if you're too anything, whatever, depending on the outrage of the moment, uh, they're going to come after you. It doesn't matter. Uh, do you think it's possible to get to a point where people are just making entertainment for entertainment's sake again, or do you think? we're going to be stuck where entertainment is always going to be political moving forward? Gosh, that's a tough question. Uh, I think the genie's kind of out of the bottle at this point, personally. Um, I mean, if you look at anything that's coming out of Hollywood or anything that's coming out of music, I mean, it, it all ends up being hyper-politicized. I mean, I just saw this bounding into article, uh, bounding into comics article about Halloween and how they're they're saying that's that's a Me Too movie. I mean, come on. I mean, that's that's unbelievable. It's just supposed to be a horror flick. Um, so do you think that um, obviously there's people who are using um, comics and entertainment as political tools? Um, do you think they can be used in the same uh, for leftist political tools? Do you think they can be used in the same way for people on the conservative side? I think it almost has to. I think uh, part of our problem in conservatism, where we've really ceded all the ground in the last 50 years, is that we've told, we've said, okay, well, you know, comics and books and film and all that, we're busy working. We're we're, we're just trying to produce things, and that's you know, the, those things aren't for us. When we ceded that ground. 
that's what laid all the framework for this. That's what laid the framework for the blacklisting, uh, for the destruction of people's lives who who try to try to speak or think differently. And I think we need to have a pushback where we can say it's okay to just have whatever ideas we want out there if it's okay for you to have your ideas out there. That that that's that's the way to have a healthy dialogue, right? It's it's to have both sides in balance uh, more than it is to. Uh, to try to silence one side or, or try to try to show you're nobler by being apolitical. I think I think we've seen that for decades and it's failed. So you you mentioned the seeding ground. Can you like specifically give us some examples of how that happened? Well, I mean, if if we want to stick to the comic industry, I, it, it just seems like. Um, a couple, you know, loud vocal people in there got in there, like uh, like Brian Michael Bendis and uh, a couple others, and they just started to to say, okay, well, Stan Lee's legacy was really about uh, really about pushing left wing politics, and you know, uh, the, it's a half truth, like it usually is, and so they push the current left wing politics as if it's something different, and that's why we see, you know, an X Men event where it's the first gay wedding in comics or whatever, all of a sudden, and then it's a Spider Man event where we're replacing Peter Parker with a half black, half Hispanic Spider-Man now, and you better like it or you're a bigot. And you see a couple of those things. And what happens over time is uh, that they, you know, when those are successful to some degree, which which the first ones were, we got to we got to mention that it, the first ones they do get they got in the media because these were shocking things. So what happened was as comics is in a decline the media picks up these events and go and goes, oh my gosh, this is so outrageous. And well, when the media circulates all these things, uh, it just gets people to rubberneck and check it out and buy it. And so you see that, you see big spikes for these things when they happen. And then they, then they settle back down a little lower than they were before as they keep declining. So they saw that and they, they unfortunately took that as success. And so they bring their friends in. And once they have like an, a preponderance of their friends in, well, then they just stop hiring the conservative people, stop calling them back. Uh, you know, one of the first people I talked to was Brett R. Smith. He's a colorist. And he told me as soon as he worked on the Clinton Cash graphic novel, which is a political graphic novel that was anti-Clinton, he never got calls again from Marvel and DC. It just like it was like a light switch that just went off. Wow. That's that's just crazy. Um, and I know you reported you, you know, one of your Federalist articles, you talk about how Chuck Dixon has been blacklisted from Marvel and he had almost iconic runs on the Punisher. Um, and then uh, you have Graham Nolan. They, for, they I mean, DC Comics seems to be a little bit different because they let Chuck and Graham um, do their little uh, Bane Maxi series. Um, do you think it's industry wide or is it set to specific publishers in the comics industry with the blacklisting? <laughs> I think it's industry wide. I think I think Chuck and Graham had a little uh, had a little leverage over DC uh, with with creating the Bane character because they they own part of that character and they they kind of have a way to dictate things to them. So they they were able to get into that and DC kind of I feel like you know I don't know this for a fact. Uh, I'm you know this is my speculation of course, but I feel like DC did that as kind of like a hush. Uh, sort of thing, like, hey, you guys have your thing, and, and we're gonna just continue what we're doing. But you look, I mean, on all of their main titles, you, you don't see any conservative people working whatsoever. Um, it's it's the same thing. Uh, Ethan Van Skyver was really the last of them, and you know, Ethan, as much as he parted ways with the company on his own terms to some degree, it was, you know, it was, it, you could tell that the situation there was hostile, and they wanted him out because he was being outspoken. Right. So you mentioned that you need to create an alternative to uh, what's happening with the, with the, within the industry. Do you think that the comics gate comics are the answer to that or do you or Arc Haven is the answer to that? Or do you think there'll be something uh, in the future that will really rise up and kind of provide like a completely alternative to um, the major like comic book publishers that are in, in the industry today? Arcaven is really the closest thing. Uh, I, I've seen it. They've got a real background in publishing from science fiction books. Uh, their books are selling actually really well. As I've heard, Alt Heroes sold uh, over 10,000 units of its first issue. So it's up there where Marvel and DC are playing at because if you look at the way that comic book shops go – um, there's a 60% sell-through rate. So if you if you say 40% of their books, you know, like a 18,000 selling book like Marvel and DC have a lot of aren't actually selling to consumers. They're really selling 10,000 units to consumers. So it's up there. Um, and what's cool about what they're doing is 
they're pushing out these books monthly at two ninety nine, at three ninety nine. Uh, if you're if you're a Prime member of Amazon, you can get free shipping. So while they're not in comic shops yet, they are actually doing things that others aren't on the Indiegogos and in producing like a, a, a one off forty eight pager that's going to be. You, you can only do a couple of those a year, right? So there's a lot going on there. Um, I think they are pushing for distribution alternatives also. Um, I'm privy to some conversations there I can't talk about, but it's really exciting stuff, and that's that's a big reason of why I've aligned with them, uh, just because the business end makes so much sense. Um, do you think aligning with them has kind of hurt your reputation within the comic book industry because of the controversy uh, that, that you were in, involved in about a month ago with the, I guess they were calling themselves the war campaign? No, I don't think so. Um, I think that uh, people want comics. They they know that they know my writing style. They know they know I've been a conservative and a Trump supporter from the start. So uh, my reputation was already hurt, and I was already blacklisted because I'm a vocal Trump supporter who writes for the Federalist. There's no way I was going to get into the comics industry at that point. Um, and so, you know, a few people uh, got mad about the war campaign thing. Once they saw, you know, kind of what was going on and how, how it was kind of like an unfair characterization of me, uh, you know, I, I got flooded with messages just saying, hey, we support you. This isn't this isn't cool. Almost every major comic uh, comics gate creator has uh, has messaged their support for me or at least talked to me privately. Uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's actually been it's been very nice uh, having the support of the consumers and the movement. That's good. Um, so kind of want to move on to some of your other projects. Um, you successfully crowdfunded uh, Flying Sparks, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was a superhero project that you had worked on previously, and uh, you're kind of doing like a reprinting of it. Uh, where are you in the, in the process of getting that out to um, your backers and consumers? Yeah, Flying Sparks I'd been working on for years with Jethro. Like, I, I have a day job and all that. And so I just had been setting aside like 100 bucks a month since like 2012 uh, doing uh, comic art with him. And, and I just say, hey, you know, do a page a month or whatever it is. And, and we'd slowly catch up. Um, so I, I've got a good cash of this stuff. Um, I printed 25 copies of it originally. So <laughs> I, saying it's a reprint isn't, isn't quite accurate. But um, – uh, it, it, I guess it is a, you know, I had a, I had some, we'll call it advanced review copies before. Um, but yeah, so it, it's, it's done now it's at the printer. I'm just kind of waiting on the printer. We had some formatting issues, which kind of slowed me down by about a week, which was unfortunate. Uh, but it's, it's there. I should, I should have it out this month sometime, uh, you know, uh, worst, worst case early November. Uh, the t-shirts and posters have already gone out to backers and I've already gotten uh, word that they've received them too. Oh, that's great. Um, so I also know that noticed that you have a new um, science fiction novel out. I believe it's called The Fight for Rislandia. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So that's my that's kind of my main claim to fame right now. It's my steampunk series, The Adventures of Baron von Monocle. It's uh, it's about a girl who inherits an airship, and it ends up just being you know a lot of airship swashbuckling wait, action. Wait. The main character is a female. Uh, yeah, strong female lead. Believe it or not, by by a minority author. It's shocking. <laughs> it is. It's, I'm, I can't believe it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So uh, um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you there. But um, so she's a she's a um, she flies a zeppelin. Is that what you're saying? I actually didn't do a zeppelin because uh, and and this is uh, this is something that's different than uh, a lot of steampunk out there. When I played Final Fantasy IV. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, the the airship had propellers, and and I wanted to be on that airship with oh. propellers that was like made out of wood, and so I made a airship with propellers made out of wood uh, because I just wanted to fulfill my childhood fantasy. Oh, I I mean I remember even in um, so Final Fantasy twelve is uh, or t no yeah twelve is my yeah, favorite. Yeah, twelve. And uh, it has the airships with the propellers too, and I'm just man, those are those are great. I'll, Good memories from I, those. I, tol I totally designed it based on Final Fantasy XII because that, that look is just beautiful. Yeah, it's like it's it really is. Um, so what else are you working on? Uh, it seems like you've got a ton of stuff uh, in the works and already just kind of coming out right now. Do you have any other uh, comic book projects that you're looking to? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't announced most stuff. Uh, it's kind of all like in the in the basic you know line art stage. Um, but I'm I'm one of those guys. I want to be Chuck Dixon when I grow up, and and that's silly because you know I'm I'm 30 something, so it, I am grown up. But uh, but Chuck Dixon really is the type of guy who just like he's coming out with 
uh, several books a month because he's just like on fire with pulp speed, just getting out there, uh, just putting out as many stories as possible. And I've always admired that. And that's always been kind of my mantra. So that's why during even during these Indiegogo campaigns, I've got these I, I had three novels come out. Um, I have the alt hero novel, uh, which is coming out next month, which I wrote. Um, I have a short story collection, uh, probably sometime in there also. Um, and on the well, comics what's the, front, uh, what's the short story collection about or what kind uh, of stories? Story, uh, just, just pure science fiction stuff. So I, uh, I, I taken basically the stuff I've written. Uh, I was running a Patreon for a bit. I, I kind of started that up again, but I haven't, I haven't pushed it yet. Um, where I was just putting out a short story a month and writing a bunch of stuff. So I've got a lot of short stories just kind of like just sitting there and they're all science fiction, no fantasy, no, no like urban fantasy or horror or whatever. It's just pure science fiction. So I've actually, I'm actually going to title it, make science fiction fun again. Um, and, uh, and, and that should, uh, that should, uh, cause some waves just because of that. Oh, I, I think so. Oh. <laughs> on, the, on the comic, on the comics front, um, I'm developing a character dynamite Thor, which was a golden age character. Uh, it's just, if you Google it, it's the most ridiculous character of all time. He is immune to explosives and he propels himself through the air by throwing uh, sticks of dynamite behind him and using the blast, uh, to, to move. It's, it's, it's just so ridiculous. So, um, <laughs> I, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's like too ridiculous. I don't know if you've watched the, or read any of the manga, my hero academia, the, one of the main rivals, he actually has a uh, power where his sweat glands produce, um, friction and he, he kind of like uses them to like fly around and creates like blasts of energy. So it's similar. Uh, yeah. My Hero Academia definitely is having a huge influence on everything I'm doing now. I, they just, I feel like that is the direction I want to see comics go in the future. <laughs> it really is the best superhero stuff, right? Right, I think right now. I agree. Um, so I did Dynamite Thor as a crossover with my Flying Sparks comic. I did a six pager, uh, which I gave out to my backers, which is already out. So if my backers got it, it was part of the stretch. It was part of the stretch goals. I sent it uh, about a month ago, and as a PDF. And so I had a lot of fun with that. And I, I just, you know, was like, I want to do a full book about this. And I found an artist to do it. So uh, we are, I believe all of the layouts are done for it. And we're about uh, a third done with the line art of it. So I'm, I don't know when I'll release it, but I'm actually not going to Indiegogo this one. Okay. I'm going to try a direct to Amazon approach just to see, just to kind of feel the market out there and just see if we can actually sustain a comic at like three ninety nine. That's a 24 page comic and, and try it that way. So we'll see how it goes. Will that be through dark Legion? Uh, that's the plan right now. Yes. Cool. Um, well, I think that's all the questions I have for you today. Um, oh, actually, one last one. Um, so where can um, people follow you, make sure that they can find out more about Dynamite Thor, um, the fight for Islandia, and uh, Ember War, and everything else you've got going on? I've got an Amazon author page, John De La Rose, J-O-N, no H. So uh, if you go look that up, that's the best place to find my book books. They're all up there. Um, they're all they're actually on sale this week. I'm not sure when this interview will come out. It might be too late. But if, if it's not, they are on sale right now. Um, and The Ember War is on Indiegogo right now. It's up for the next 14 days. It is about 80 percent funded right now. Uh, this this one took a lot of uh, a lot of capital on the art. So we're trying to uh, trying to get 20,000 for this one. So I would appreciate if you come to that probably first. And then, uh, you know, I've got a blog, Delarose.com, where I pretty much announce everything, and I've got a mailing list there. That's probably the best way to communicate with me directly. All right. Well, thank you very much, John. Um, hope you enjoyed being the first guest on the interview uh, presented by AboundingIntoComics.com. I've been your host, John Trent, and we'll talk to you next time.